Hi there, welcome to Alpine Bravo. My name is Brendan and this is my channel for all things Microsoft Flight Simulator. In this video we'll be carrying on with our series of tutorials on the FlySimware Learjet 35A and this tutorial will be looking at the aircraft engines or power plant. As well as giving an overview of how the engines function, we'll be looking at the key subsystems including the oil, fuel and fuel computers, the ignition, engine controls, the starter system, instrumentation, and the D. Howard TR-400 thrust reversers. The aircraft is powered by two TFE 731-2-2B turbofans, each delivering 3,500 pounds of static thrust. These are very typical of a lightweight turbofan engine with a fan at the front, and a number of compressors uh, sections after that with a turbine section which is the hot part of the engine where the ignition and combustion occurs of the fuel uh, producing the jet of hot gas some of which is used directly for thrust some of which is routed back to the fan at the front uh, which then essentially acts like a propeller producing additional thrust and the fan, in fact, accounts for most of the aircraft's thrust at lower altitudes and the reducing efficiency of the fan as the aircraft climbs accounts for reduced performance at higher altitudes and, of course, the fact that there is less air. The engines are cooled and lubricated by an oil system. There is no real need to go into the detail of how that operates other than to note what the key indications and warnings are. So on the engine instrument panel we have an oil pressure left and right indication which you can see in PSI with a small green arc on either side which is a nominal operating pressure and likewise a temperature gauge, an oil temperature gauge left and right. There are a number of enunciators that will indicate if there is an oil pressure issue. The low oil pressure red indicator on the Glare Shield Master Caution panel. And that will illuminate if there is a low oil pressure condition in either engine. But that is also supplemented by two additional cautions, a left and a right low oil over on the co-pilot side here as well, which will give an additional indication of who the positioning of that light may make it difficult to observe in the simulator. Turning to the engine's fuel management, this is primarily performed by a fuel control unit, which operates in the background. There is no switches or controls in the cockpit that you need to worry about for the FCU. However, the aircraft is also equipped with two fuel computers which are sort of like an early version of FADEC and they do automate quite a few of the functions associated with the management of the engines and the fuel computers are located behind the switches for those are located behind the pilot control wheel which I've hidden to allow you to see them. And in normal operation, they will always be left on and they provide for automatic control of a number of the aircraft engine operations. And specifically during engine starts, the fuel computers will automatically schedule the use of the igniters and also will automatically turn on the standby fuel pump in the relevant wing for that engine. They also prevent overspeed occurring and will keep the air the engine from not exceeding ITT limits during a normal start. And during flight they will also schedule the fuel to avoid compressor stalls in the low pressure section of the turbine. If either fuel computer fails this will be enunciated here on the master caution panel with the left or right fuel computer. So if either of those eliminate when the fuel computers are turned on then you have a potential failure. You can try and cycle them and see if that brings it back. 
And of course, if the have been turned off deliberately by the pilot, uh, then you will also get that indication. As we can see, if we turn off the left fuel computer, now we have the left fuel computer indicator on. And as I say, these should always be on in normal operation. Just beneath the fuel computer switches, we have this SPR switch. That stands for Start Pressure Regulator. And this will be used when starting the engines in very low temperatures. So if it was below, I believe it's uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is about minus 17 degrees Celsius, you would use this switch to overcome some of the limitations that the fuel computer places on the engine during start to allow more fuel to be introduced to allow a hotter ignition sequence. And how you would use this if those temperatures did persist during the startup sequence, during light off, you would hold this in the either the left or the right position as necessary, keep it held, and that will then accelerate the ignition, but then you must monitor the ITT of the engine very carefully, and you should release the SPR switch back to the neutral off position in the middle, between 300 and 400 degrees C on the ITT. The only other thing to be aware of in relation to fuel in the engines is the fuel flow indicator dial here. There are two needles left and right, one for each engine. The two needles are on top of one another at the moment, which is why only one is visible. And that will indicate the fuel flow in pounds, thousands of pounds per hour. The ignition system consists of a solid state ignition system, dual ignition exciters on the engine and two igniter plugs in the combustion chamber. And it operates in two modes, automatic and manual. With the fuel computers on, it will turn on the igniters automatically whenever the start gen switch is placed into the start position. Operation of the igniters is indicated by the amber indicator light above each of the air ignition switches there. It is also possible to manually or selectively turn on the igniters and this should be done always for takeoff and landing and also if flying in heavy rain or snow or other conditions that may increase the risk of a flame out and that is achieved simply by switching these into the on position. The engines are controlled via these two power or thrust levers mounted on the center pedestal. The power levers have three positions essentially Fully aft, they are in the cutoff position, and that sits behind a detente. And when in this position, no fuel will reach the engines. And during engine start, you would then advance it to the idle position. And you could see that there is a switch animated there indicating the detente. And then from the idle position, there are no further detentes all the way through to the maximum stop. At maximum power. These levers here are for the reverse thruster system. We will cover that in the later part of this tutorial. You may have noticed when I was operating the power lever then that there were a couple of switches beneath and I shall just move the power levers forward to get a clearer view. These two switches here are for the engine synchronization system. This isn't modeled in the aircraft at the moment, but I'll just explain what the function is. Essentially, the sync engine synchronization allows the aircraft to automatically synchronize the output of each engine when they're quite close to others. So basically when you're flying in a cruise and you want to make sure that both engines are at the same power setting, that can be quite tricky to do manually, which is what we have to do at the moment. However, in a real aircraft, if uh, you were to place this uh, switch here into the sync position 
and the engines were within, I think it's 2.5% N1 of one another, then the right engine will be synced to the output of the left engine. The switch here will determine whether it's going to sync to the fan, which is the N1 value, or the turbine, which is the N2 value, and I'll explain what those indicators are in the next segment. However, neither of these functions are, although you can switch that, it doesn't have any function in the aircraft at the moment. Each engine has a starter generator mounted on it. These units are controlled by the relevant left and right gen starter switches. For starting an engine, you simply place the switch into the lower position. And if the fuel computers are on, then it will automatically turn on the ignition and the standby fuel pump for that wing. And the start will be enunciated with this red light here. And that will continue automatically until an N1 of 45 or so is reached. And then the system, the starter will be turned off automatically. And at that point, you can take the switch from the start position into the generator position. You do have to do that yourself, though that is not uh, done automatically. So if we move the start down here, we can see we have a red light illuminated. And the ignition will not occur until fuel is introduced. And you do that by moving the power lever from the cutoff into the idle position. So there is ignition started and you can see the turbine uh, is going up, the ITT is going up and the fan is going up. The red light has now gone out indicating that the start sequence is complete and we've achieved a stable temperature on the ITT, uh, meaning that you can then place that switch into the generator. The key instrumentation for monitoring the engines are located in these six dials here, uh, split between the left and the right engine. So at the top we have what is called turbine, and that is N2, and that measures the output as a percentage of the total RPM of the engine at that stage from the hot set from the turbine section of the engine. And we have a dial with a green arc and then a, a yellow and red, a yellow arc and a red mark there. And we've also got a digital indicator here in the middle, which is particularly useful. The next dial down is the turbine temperature or ITT, which stands for interstage turbine temperature in hundreds of degrees Celsius and again green arc with a yellow arc and a red line and the hard limit is 860 degrees Celsius you never want to exceed that and below that there is a portion around about 835 I'll cover it in a separate tutorial on engine starts where you would uh, want to limit the amount of time the engine was at that temperature either during start or normal operation. And the third dial in the group is the fan speed and that is N1 and again that is a percentage of the total RPM that the fan will operate at, normally operate at very very high RPMs. Now, that is used in the handbook, that is indicated as the primary method of measuring engine power and performance, that is the dial that you should monitor, however, in real life pilots on the FSR Discord server have indicated that in reality they would also monitor N2 quite closely, and there is a difference that N1 is more affected by changes in altitude and you will see as you climb N1 often decreases whereas N2 will remain steadier although it will change as well to some extent depending on the outside temperature.
monitoring of these instruments, whichever you choose to monitor in flight is very important and often it is the ITT that is the limiting factor and in crews it can be more worthwhile monitoring ITT than anything else if you're seeking to get maximum cruise performance. Turning finally now to the aircraft reverse thruster system. As mentioned already, this is the D. Howard TR400 variant. There are other types of reverse thruster available for the Learjet 35A, such as the Aeronica. However, this is the model that we've got, and it is controlled in two places. First of all, we have the thrust reverser panel here at the top of the glare shield. And then we also have two reverse thrust levers mounted on the power levers. Looking at the glare shield, we have two switches and four enunciators. And you'll find them in the off position normally, and then you can either arm them or you can run the test as well, and that allows us to see what the other enunciator light is. And the green arm will only show when the aircraft is on the ground, when there's weight on the wheels, as there are safety interlocks to prevent the thrust reversers deploying in the air, and they are only used on the ground. And once they have been armed and you start to pull the thrust lever aft, or respect to the thrust lever aft, so we'll pull the left one aft, then you'll see the deploy light come on. And if we go outside the aircraft, we'll now see that the clamshell doors have sprung open and they will be deflecting all of the thrust forward, providing that braking action. The doors only have two positions, they're either fully shut or fully open. And depending on what bindings you use or how you've set it up, some combinations may result in partial opening of the doors or an animation of a partial opening. If you see that, then that's not right. Uh, you need to figure out a different way of doing your bindings. And for suggestions on one way of binding it, do see part one of the tutorial series where I go over what controls I use on my Honeycomb Bravo. In terms of operation, the thrust reverser should always be armed for takeoff and landing. Their use on landing is not unusual, particularly on a shorter runway. How much you want to use is going to be up to you. It depends how much you've floated your landing. However, the reversers shouldn't be used below 60 knots indicated and once you start to get towards that speed you should smoothly reduce the reverse thrust lever back to the idle position or fully forward and allowing the doors to close. If you use maximum reverse thrusts at speed lower than that you run the risk of foreign object damage to the engines. It is possible to deploy them asymmetrically so you could have one thrust reverser deployed when taxiing, that might be helpful for keeping taxi speeds under control. However, you would not wish to deploy them asymmetrically when landing. You'll want both thrust reversers armed and deployed at the same time. Well, that concludes everything in this tutorial on the Learjet 35A engines. I've obviously not gone into the amount of detail that it would be possible to go into, However, if I've missed anything important out or you've got any observations, please let me know in the comments. If you found this useful, you want to check out the other videos in this tutorial series. And if you liked it, do hit the like button. I really like it when people <laughs> hit the like button. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.